Good morning and welcome to Crossroads UMC online this Sunday. Just two announcements before we begin. The first is our Shore Neighborhood Block Party is coming up August 12th at King Park. It's on the corner of 6th and High. Begins at 2 p.m. and goes all the way to 8 p.m. You can come and experience the diversity of our Northwest End here downtown in Canton in our Greater Shore neighborhood. We got kids games, bounce houses, food, and a whole heck of a lot of fun to come and enjoy on August 12th from 2 to 8 p.m. on the corner of 6th and High at King Park. The next one is a little bit further down the road, September 10th. If you are watching us online, we want to invite you to be in church here in person on September 10th for Picture Day as we recreate a picture that was created here on the corner of Tuscan Cleveland back in the 1800s. If you are connected to our church anyway, you log on online, you watch Crossroads online, you volunteer in our free stores, we would like you in our church photo September 10th, immediately following worship at 11 a.m. We'll have worship in the sanctuaries. We always do at 10 a.m. And right as soon as worship's done, we'll head right out on the corner and take your picture, and then you can go and enjoy the afternoon with your families. Now, as we engage Sunday online today, as we look at loving our neighbors just a little bit better here for this final week, I invite you now to prepare your hearts and minds for worship.
Friends, our scripture reading today is going to come from the book of Matthew, chapter 19, and verse 13. And the specific neighbors that we're going to look at loving just a little bit better today are our smallest neighbors. And this scripture picks up, Then little children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them, but Jesus said, Let the children come to me, and do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And he laid his hands on them, and he went on his way. Friends, may God add a reading to the to the may God add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and the living of his holy word. Thanks be to God. So welcome back to this series. Uh, for the past couple of weeks, we have been looking at the neighbors that we have here downtown. And we've been talking in in-person worship about what it means to be a neighbor to Canton, Ohio. And way back in week one, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at residents from our Greater Shore neighborhood who are looking for better housing conditions and those kinds of things. And this and these are good folks in our neighborhood who are out and lobbying, lobbying for policy changes with folks from the vet, for the, uh, with the with the VA and folks who had disabilities in our neighborhoods. And what can we do to start paying more attention to them to make safer streets, cleaner sidewalks? straighter sidewalks and so that him and his wheelchair could make it up and down and that we can start creating a community for all people. Last week, I get it, we replayed a message from 2021, but Pastor Jeff in person talked about our neighbors here downtown who have moved here from Mexico and Guatemala and Latin America. If you were watching online, you got a message about immigration history in the United States. And we begin to ask ourselves, pay attention as you walk around our city streets here in Canton, Ohio. One of the fastest growing populations we have is our Latin American population, moving into our homes, fixing them up, moving their families here, and moving their families here, opening up businesses and being a part of our community. And it's incumbent upon us, just as the book of Deuteronomy says, to love the stranger, the immigrant, the migrant, for once we were strangers in Egypt. And today, the neighbor I want to focus on, based on our scripture test, are the smallest ones, kids. And you might not know this, when I got appointed to this church in 2019, I had people tell us, well, there's not very many young families around here. Let me bust that myth straight from the start. If you look just in our core neighborhoods downtown, from where we are on the corner of Tustin, Cleveland, there are almost 5,000 900 children under the age of 18 that live right around this church. That's a lot of kids. That is larger than the population of Canal Fulton. So it should be incumbent upon us about the kinds of communities we're creating for even the youngest among us. And the reason I put on the red sweater again, because this principle was one that Fred Rogers had. And it's parallel in the gospel text with Jesus that despite their differences and capabilities, all children and people are special in their own right and that each individual has divine worth and potential. Every single one of those 5,900 children that live here around our church. After all, Jesus said, let the children come to me. A Sunday school teacher asked her children as they were going on their way to church service, and why is it necessary to be quiet in church, children? One bright little girl replied, because people are sleeping. Aaron and I were in a church service in Vilsack, Germany, once where we lived. James was in the church with us because in many times we didn't have any other kids but the one. On our on-post chapel, they didn't have nursery workers, so you had to bring them in. And it was always a hard thing to do. And at some point during the service, the chaplain began giving a sermon. He began to cough. And James, who was sitting there, started mocking the chaplain, started coughing very loudly and going into his own coffee fit. And then later in that service, Aaron and I must have been enjoying the sermon because an older couple behind us tapped us on the shoulder to say, he's getting away. As we looked a few pews back, James was pulling all the hymnals right out all over the floor. And it's an embarrassing thing to do. It's tough to get your kids to church. Heck, even getting to church can be difficult to get the whole family there. Every time I have four kids now, and it's an incredibly hard thing to do, and I'm not even the one that does it. I get to work. It's about 6, 6.30 every Sunday for in-person worship. And every night before we go to bed, I have the same conversation with my four boys. I say, guys, tomorrow's Sunday. And they say, oh, I know, I know. I said, don't tell me you know. What do you know? get myself up, get myself dressed, get myself breakfast, and help mom with the little ones. I said, that's it. Because I know that it's an incredibly hard thing for her to do and get four boys to church every week. 
When we first started attending a church when we lived in Columbus, Ohio, Maple Grove United Methodist, we were often, and we only had two kids then, late for service. And we had this streak of sneaking into the back of church and maybe nobody would notice. But one Sunday at Maple Grove, they had changed the service time for a special New Year's Eve service and we don't pay attention to the church email. So we weren't there on time to hear the announcement. So we showed up at the church and we heard the organist's beautiful organ playing and thought, oh, we're just in time for the prelude. We sit down, someone in the front row turns around, tells us, that's actually the postlude. You miss service. Church is over. And we got up and we left. We missed the whole service. But Jesus even said, let the children come to me. I often ask myself, though, does it have to be church? Can't the kids come to Jesus some other way? Why church? They're so loud. None of them can sit still. When kids were my age, they didn't act like that in church. But come to think of it, I did. In our gospel reading this morning, they... Assumedly, the parents were bringing their children to Jesus. And you know, they didn't have the Honda Odyssey with the entertainment system and everything else the kids have. They weren't so comfortable in that way. They would have been very grumpy when they got there. And they didn't have anything like that. I think they only had four Windstars back in Jesus' day. Even so, I bet these parents the night before could have been up late with their babies and they were tired. Or maybe they were tried to get to bed on time, but after the eighth glass of water, 12th bedtime story, two bathroom breaks, 17 songs, one sliced apple, one change of sheets later, the plan went out the window. You know we have to get them up early, the husband says, Jesus is coming tomorrow. They don't want to, but they get up anyway, brush their teeth, throw in down a mildly nutritious breakfast, and well, they head out the door to make the long walk to where this man Jesus was. After all, they had heard that he could heal people and that he was a man close to God. So we should take the kids so they get to church. I mean to where Jesus was said that he would be. And they're excited. Their kids are saying, when do we get to see Jesus? You said he was a pretty important man. But well, well, kids, we have to wait in line. He, now, it's, it's hot out here. I, I'm sorry. You shouldn't have thrown off your hat on the donkey all the way back there. I'm thirsty. I told you they would not have drinks there. And you were supposed to remember your water before we go. I have to go to the bathroom. You get the point. They finally get there. And they were bringing their children for him to pray over. It's in the book of Mark that the parents bring their children to Jesus. And I remember reading that and it struck me that the Bible doesn't tell us that there was anything particularly wrong with the children and that they were sick or that they needed healing. Unlike the other stories, they were just bringing their children so that he could pray over them. They didn't have all the answers to parenting, to raising kids. They might not even have ever joined a mother's Facebook group or read what to expect when you're expecting or all the other books you're supposed to read when you have kids. No. The book of Mark says, and they were bringing their children for him to touch. Matthew says for him to pray. See, there just seemed to be something right about doing this. There just seemed to be something right about this man, Jesus, and that they wanted to bring their children to him. I think that happens a lot when people have kids. You know, we beep off through life until kids arrive and we go, whoa, I'm responsible for something. Who is this thing? How do I use it? And some of us say, well, better start going to church till we find out how hard it is to get them there on time. Now, we all know church folk, though, don't we? The scripture tells us that the disciples rebuked them, yelled at them, in other words. I stopped reading again. Who's them? The kids? Nope. The Greek indicates that they were yelling at the parents. It even comes out in the English. They, the parents, as it says in the book of Mark, were bringing their children, but the disciples yelled at them, rebuked them. Stop it. He's busy. Keep quiet. Stop squirming. We didn't raise our kids to act like that in church. Jesus doesn't have the time, but thank the Lord Jesus sees this, was upset and said, let the children come to me. And then he goes on to say one of the most vexing things in the New Testament. It is to these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of heaven like a child will not go in. But they're just kids, Jesus. What do they know? The one of them just had his pants down peeing on the tree in front of everybody. You saw him. 
But what do you mean, receive the kingdom of heaven like a child? You want me to receive the kingdom of God like that group of hooligans slinging mud over there at each other? Or how about the one with the finger in his nose? How about that one? Receive the kingdom of heaven like a child. They can't even spell it. Confusing to some, maybe, but to a guy like Fred Rogers, it made perfect sense to him. Jesus, children, were capable of much more than what everybody thinks. But what did Jesus mean? I mean, do children really have the capacity to know who Jesus is, what he's about, even have a relationship with him? I had a professor early in seminary tell me a story about a Sunday school class she was teaching. In her class, she had lots of kids, but one boy in particular was autistic. He couldn't sit still, but often removed himself from social interaction with her and other kids, and she admitted that she would often get frustrated with him and not know what to do. But one Easter morning, she was preparing her Sunday school classroom, and this year she was excited because she and her husband had made a miniature set of the tomb and little figures of Jesus' followers to go along with the tomb. Well, this boy was the first one in her room before any of the other kids came in, and she continued to set up, and she looked and realized that he was there first, and she thought, oh, he's going to mess him up before any of the other kids come in here. And the kid uh, was playing with the figurines that her and her husband had spent so much time on. But when she looked a little bit closer at what he was doing, she had seen the boy have Mary Magdalene walked him up to the tomb. He raced her back to get the others, grabbed the other disciples and his little fingers. He grabbed Peter and John, and he raced them three back to the tomb. And he would repeat it, gathering others. And it took her a minute to realize that he was reenacting the celebration of the resurrection and the risen Christ. And when she asked him what he was doing, he simply said, I'm praying. Friends, there are a few points I want to make today, but the first one is this. A child's deepest need is for a relationship. Children, particularly the youngest among us, are capable of loving God with their whole being much in the same way that is expressed when I do my music lesson. I often do music lessons ahead of our free store worship. Recently, I've played all kinds of silly songs because I've noticed all of the kids who are coming into our free store on Tuesday mornings. And I play all kinds of silly songs like Steve Miller Band's Dance, 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 or a version of 12 Bar Blues, but it's really Mary Had a Little Lamb that I took from Stevie Ray Vaughan. Even so, you see how they're able to express themselves with their whole bodies when they dance. They have a natural ability to joy their relationship with God in such a way. But like the scripture says, we are the they. Children still have to be brought to Jesus for this relationship. And guess what? This means a whole lot more than just coming to church on Sundays. A child's innate hunger for relationship with God and his or her parents is something that is hardwired in us. But the problem is that many of us growing up just simply and merely received information about God. It may have provided for our minds with ideas, but it didn't warm our hearts in the sense of touching the whole person. Because like I said, that's how young children love, and that's how they experience the world. Picture a child dancing, if you will. Oftentimes, we as parents and educators are too preoccupied with getting quick results in terms of behavior instead of allowing the child to come into relationship with God free from their worries about what they should or should not do. You see, though, that's the disciples coming out of us. No, don't do it that way. Pray like this. Sit like this. Kneel like this. Which brings me to the older category. As I talked about the thousands of kids that live down there, a large section of them are older teens. College age, men and women. High school age, men and women. Mind you, before this, I used to teach at a university where I worked dil diligently to establish small groups of communities and ROTC programs. So before I began, I had to answer questions like why it seemed that so many teens and young adults leave religion and the church behind to begin with. 
A national study of youth and religion at Notre Dame found that while a sizable number of teenagers attend church, just 8% are what is considered highly devoted teenagers whose faith makes a significant difference in their lives. They said that while a majority of American teenagers describe themselves as Christian, in reality they espouse a version of Christianity the researchers termed moralistic, therapeutic deism. It's a kind of self-centered faith that Kenda Creasy Dean simply terms almost Christian. Dean's choice of terminology is derived from sermons preached by both George Whitfield and John Wesley, where almost Christians, said Wesley, go through the motions of religion without committing to a relationship, dancing as if a child to a song they want to dance to. This reference is not an indictment of a certain Christian belief, but rather a form of cultural Christianity that has the semblance and language of authentic faith, but lacks heart and soul. Dr. Kenda Dean, a United Methodist elder and professor at Harvard Divinity School, wrote a book about this, and she called it Almost Christian. Dean names four characteristics that occur regularly in those whom they studied, teens who were highly devoted to their faith. She says that teenagers are learning very well the kind of faith and belief that their parents and congregations actually espouse, and it's more of a feel-good replacement of Christianity, watered-down version of the gospel that's infiltrated many of our churches, and that's wooed us into believing a self-serving, feel-good, do-good gospel that is a far cry from the self-giving love of Jesus Christ. But the problem is that this lackluster, less than consequential faith of American teenagers is a direct result of what teens see, have seen in their churches and their parents for years. And that rather the consequential faith that reflects Christ who sends his people as he is sent into the world to be the light of the world, to give healing and hope, to suffer perhaps even unjustly behalf, on the behalf of others. When Christians and teenagers live with this kind of missional imagination, then the consequential Christianity turns self-focused spirituality onto its head. The first practice that Dean says parents and congregations must take on is that they must pass on a consequential faith to their teens around them, primarily this faith that is modeled to imitate Christ to a daunting degree because it's hardwired within us. Secondly, she speaks of the art of testimony that has anchored Christian faith for centuries, the ability to tell about the witness of one's faith to to, to articulate it to our children and our children's children. She says Christian teenagers who refer to their faith frequently and interpreted their lives in religious terms also had ready religious vocabulary at their disposal. It was talked about. This is the active role of parents. And then it's more than just what you do to bring your kids to church on just one day a week. It's what they see and hear from you the other six days. And this is not to say we don't mess up. We mess up all the time in my house. But one of the best phrases you can ever utter to your children is, I'm sorry. Can I try that again? I didn't mean to get so mad. You know, I messed up. Could I have a redo? Would you forgive me? But oftentimes we don't put our children in a place for them to be able to extend the grace to us because we're not giving that to ourselves. Dean says that faith is about a way of life, not only a body of information and stuff that we want our kids to be able to know, it's about a way of life, something that they see, something that is consequential. The task of parents who desire a consequential faith for their kids is to introduce them to their way of life, not simply a way of believing. Oftentimes, we just think that the kids don't have enough potential or understanding to take it on, but I'm here to tell you otherwise. It was a couple months ago that uh, our kids here in our in-person service, right after the children's message, go back, the smaller ones go back uh, to their Sunday school classroom. And it was the first Sunday of the month, and we were having Eucharist. We were having communion here in church. 
And I must have been having a good lesson, but I didn't see the kids come forward for communion that time, and I didn't think much of it. And so after church, I'd said my goodbyes to most people, but there were some kids milling about the altar up front, and I went back up to the front, and I said, can I help you guys with something? They said, you did it without us. I said, did what without you? She goes, you had the bread and juice without us. And I said, you know, you're right. We did. And my heart sank. And she goes, do you mind if I hand it out to everybody else? And there were a bunch of other kids, four or five other kids milling about. And she went ahead, broke the bread and handed it out. Simply handed pieces of bread and said, the body of Christ given for you. She knew the words, but she also knew something deeper and that she had been left out and that I had forgotten. After she had finished handing out the bread and the juice at that time that they all enjoyed, and she goes, you know, you never ask us to help with this. We could help. And I said, you know, you're right. So I spent the next couple of weeks writing a children's liturgy and then the next communion we had, I made sure that they were there and I made sure I offered them the grace in helping. See, I see a common theme here in both our youngest ones and our older ones is that we often don't take them seriously enough. The disciples wanted to push them away as if they were something just frivolous. But 5,900 kids live around this church. Who could we be? What will our faith community be in another 20 years if we took them as seriously as we take ourselves? Friends, I want to invite you in this time. It is a first Sunday, so we're going to take communion together. And so if you feel free to go ahead and pause the video and go and grab up your communion elements as we partake in the Lord's Supper together. Friends, the Lord Jesus Christ invites all to his table who love him, who earnestly seek to be forgiven for their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we ask that your Holy Spirit come upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they might be for us the very body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world until his Son comes to reign in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Friends, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he simply took bread, lifted it to heaven, and gave thanks and broke it. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, an ordinary cup. He lifted it to heaven and gave thanks. And he says, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you in the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Friends, I hope you enjoyed at least these last couple of weeks where we've tried to get to know some of our neighbors around here. And honestly, we were doing it because so many people in our community, especially it seems in Canton, Ohio, just get written off written off as people being not worth our time. We might not necessarily think that of ourselves, but oftentimes we condescend to our kids. Fred Rogers didn't do that. And I hope that as a church, we can begin to start taking our kids, especially those 5,900 kids more seriously right around here, because with their potential, the future of the Christian movement and this church lies within it. And who knows what God has in store for them next. Friends, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Go in peace, have a great week, and we'll see you back here next week.